the bike yeah. dropped about 12 feet in. And to make a long story short, I realized I wasn't going to stop. And wow. Mm. Uh, you got to excuse the PTSD. Yeah. Anyway, I hit a brick wow. wall at 30 miles an hour head on. Jesus. And, um, um, kind of comical, cut the front end off the motorcycle, threw me up against the wall, the motorcycle hit me, and off the cedar cyanide trauma center I went. The bad news was uh, I broke my neck, C5, 6, and 7. Oh. <laughs> and uh, I got some PTSD from it. So when I go to read yeah. sometimes, it, but it's not bad. God's been good. Mm. God's been good. Yes, it changed, it changed everything. I lost four years of work. But I actually went back to work. Join the conversation and welcome to Inside Voice. You know, we live in a celebrity culture where beauty, fame, money, and power are considered the sign of success. But what is it like to live inside the high-speed world of Hollywood's who's who until it all comes crashing down in an instant? Sometimes painful situations that put us out of control have a way of magnifying our anxieties when old demons come back to haunt us. Such was the case for my guest today. In the mid-1980s, John Alden drove headfirst into a Hollywood stuntman career and quickly found success, doubling actors like Harrison Ford, Burt Reynolds, Tommy Lee Jones, and Mark Harmon. But the devastating trauma that he carried in his heart, which came from his father's suicide just six days after his ninth birthday, drove him to alcohol and drug abuse, broken relationships, rehab centers, and eventually contemplating his own life. But God had a different plan. And I want you to welcome my friend with me, John. I am so pleased and thrilled to have you here with me today, my friend. Thank I'm you good. for joining us. Hi, Brenda. How are you? Doing great, and you look wonderful, my friend. Not bad for an old beat-up motocross. <laughs> not, not too bad. You know, we met about eight years ago now, I think, uh, out at the Glen Helen racetracks. Uh, you and my husband used to motocross together in, what did they call that group? That was called RAN. It was a Saturday motocross race for a lot of the industry people and the uh, some people would come out and race on Saturdays. And yes, your husband used to throw a lot of dirt on me. Yeah, I had a lot of fun out there watching you guys racing. And oh my gosh, you guys have a lot of talent. It, it really was, uh, it really was, some, those were some good years, weren't they? I miss those days. I miss, yeah. I miss your husband being the... Uh, part-time uh, pastor of the REM races on Saturday. That's right. Yeah, he enjoyed that. Well, listen, I want to jump in. You know, people think that Hollywood is just so glamorous and uh, they just have this idea about that being kind of the pinnacle of success. I mean, is it really that glamorous? Tell us a little about it. Hollywood is overwhelming. Hollywood is Hollywood. I, I think um, the biggest thing is that most people let um, what they do become who they are. And mm -hmm. for me, it was uh, just another escape to run from my father's suicide, which mm -hmm. I never really dealt with. So I had no fear of getting hurt. I had no fear. Of, it was just something to do, you know, and, and I was mm -hmm. fortunate enough to have a door open for me. Some very famous stepman named Mike Renyard said yes when I asked the question if I would help him. But yes, Hollywood, there's a lot of dark sides to Hollywood, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people find identity in the things they do well, their talents. Um, and we, we, we live in a culture that says, fake it till you make it, you know, where we're all kind of projecting these lies, just hoping that everyone will buy the package we're selling and, and that they'll love us for that. And, you know, I found in my own life that that didn't work for me either. But, uh, you know, you were uh, in a movie called The Italian Job. Yes. When, uh, I mean, you've got a, an A-list of movies that are on your resume. It's amazing. But in this particular uh, shoot, you were doing a stunt. I want you to describe that stunt, what happened to you, and how that changed the tra trajectory of your career and your whole life, really. Um, I was cast as one of the three motorcycle guards uh, that would guard the armored cars on the Italian job. And about six days into my shoot, uh, we were working at the corner of Hollywood and Highland, and we were supposed to drive down the real-life subway tunnel, which goes underground. And uh, 
I was supposed to jump, and I did jump a, a BMW police bike down into the hallway. Uh, the bad news is, is um, I didn't get a rehearsal, which is not uncommon, but I did this jump about the bike dropped about 12 feet in. And to make a long story short, I realized I wasn't going to stop. And wow. Mm. Uh, you got to excuse the PTSD. Yeah. Anyway, I hit a brick wow. wall at 30 miles an hour head on. Jesus. And um, um, kind of comical, cut the front end off the motorcycle, threw me up against the wall. The motorcycle hit me. And off the Cedar Sinai Trauma Center, I went. The bad news was uh, I broke my neck, C5, 6, and 7. Oh. <laughs> and uh, I got some PTSD from it. So when I go to read yeah. sometimes, it, but it's not bad. God's been good. Mm. God's been good. Yes, it changed, it changed everything. I lost four years of work, but I actually went back to work. Oh. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. You know, it's a miracle that you're even walking my friend, <laughs> uh, let alone uh, can sit here and talk about it. And, mm -hmm. you know, people don't realize what uh, trauma does to the body and the body keeps a score, a physical score of trauma. But you've had many types of trauma. And so experiencing something like this really puts you in uh, the kind of challenge that would open up some of those older wounds that came and the traumas that really came during your childhood. Can you talk about how difficult it was to be in that position, physically traumatized, mentally traumatized, emotionally, your career is on the line, your relationships begin to unravel. What happened in those days? Can you, can you walk us through that? The good news is, is, you know, um, I had been sober since 1992, since I had yeah. my encounter with Jesus, but we won't go there. But uh, it was pretty bad right away. Uh, I mean, I couldn't work, and I actually went back to work. Uh, they sent me out of the hospital in three days. I went back as an actor. I couldn't do stunts. But um, mm. the hardest part was over the next year, I couldn't get any. I, they shipped me off to a whole bunch of different doctors, and they didn't know what to do. Finally, I got my neck fused in 2003. Uh, and uh, started the healing process. I actually got married uh, to Kelly and yeah. we had our first child in 2006. But in 2006, um, the PTSD started kicking in and I started to become wow. unhealthy. And uh, what you said about trauma, I don't, I don't sleep well to this day. If I sleep two hours straight, it's a gift. Um, wow. Things that I didn't know about. Yeah, it's it, it just is what it is. And then I'll go wow. and crash for a day. But yeah, um, the hardest part was... Um, wanting to work and not be able to work and then when i had to make the decision in 2008 to step away to become a full-time parent because of the divorce i couldn't go to the when i would go to the movies for the next two or three years i'd cry <laughs> mm, yeah yeah the i get heart, it the heart wanted to work the last thing i wanted to do was have to walk away from my career that i had gotten back but god mm. had realized that it was time to be a single parent and he let me know that and so you mm. walk on you know and uh i love that you're being this vulnerable and this transparent because the journey is sometimes messy and we in our christian culture especially with our western mindset of success and you know blessing and all these things that we we limit what that journey looks like. And, and, and we tend to want to run from our pain and our painful experiences. I've talked about this many times, how that, you know, the things that we bury alive um, are the things that we're giving power to. So what happens, you know, when we're in the middle of our journey, we're trying to make everything feel good and, and be successful and be what we think God wants us to be. But then suddenly something happens that's out of our control and we start to come unraveled. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, suddenly we're losing all the control that we've had right. and we don't know what to do with that. So I appreciate that you're talking um, so honestly about how the process has looked for you and, and it continues to, I mean, you continue to, you're still expecting that total healing over the, the traumas and the PTSD, the, you know, the long-term effects of that. But what happens when 
our relationships fall apart and Jesus is the only one that we have. Uh, tell me about how he's become a lover of your soul, John. You know, um, I had a lot of abandonment issues and rejection issues with my father. Yeah. But um, when the divorce happened and Callie was going to move out, so she couldn't handle the PTSD. And I couldn't either. We didn't know for four months after the divorce what I actually had. But I just had to dig down. I, I knew because mm -hmm. God had given me the blessing of being a dad and, and, and then yeah. being the dad to my daughter, you know, who's almost the world champ at BMX at 14 years old. And, you know, and it's. Um, they're amazing. Uh, they, the kids no, are amazing. They're, they're good, you know. But the, yeah. the bottom line is I, I, sobriety taught me a lot. Mm. And then getting back with Jesus taught me more. But, God, you know, for me, God sent me to AA before he sent me back to church. And we'll get into that later. Yeah. It's, if I had not been sober, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have made it. The, mm. the desire to use and drink were no longer there because they no longer were a legal tool to use. God put that through me. I understood that, wow. and otherwise, um, I, I don't think I would have ever been able to handle it, but it, it was all Jesus. I dug in. The, the greatest part was is that one day we were coming back to the house from Santa Anita Mall in Arcadia, and my kids were like five and six, and they wanted to pull over and they asked, <laughs> they asked Jesus wow. into their hearts. Wow. <laughs> Through yeah. all of this, they got to stay grounded, and they got to understand yeah. that, and they understand you know, dad used to be a drug addict and dad used to be a stop stunt man. But dad's yeah. always been here. Dad stopped his life to help us. And, yeah. you know, it's... it's <clears throat> That's beautiful. It's all and, God because if God didn't empower me, I wouldn't be able yeah. to do it. I'm powerless yeah. on my own. It's all Jesus. Yeah. And you've maintained a friendship with their mama. Oh, and I've just been you. so proud of you guys. Um, your oh, kids are... <laughs> Beautiful, amazing children that are really growing up to be amazing young people that I believe God's going to use in a powerful way. And listen, I can so relate to you uh, in this area. Uh, there's a song by Adele and she, the, their lyrics are, go easy on me, baby. I was just a child. I didn't have the chance to feel the world around me. And I think that is the case for children who have been traumatized at a young age. Um, my, uh, my experience, I was eight years old when, when I was sexually abused and the, the trauma that it caused was deep, deep, deep. Right. You experienced a trauma just after your ninth birthday. Can you tell us about that, because I, I want people to understand that that these layers, listen, everybody has a story. Every one of us has a story. We have something painful in our lives and something that we're dealing with. And oftentimes we're trying to force it down, cover it up, and, and we don't want to acknowledge it. But Jesus is inviting us to acknowledge that pain that oftentimes we don't even realize is there because we think it's so far gone. Right. And so far removed, but it will come back to haunt us. And, you know, and, and here we are in this after two years of a pandemic and the world shaking and all these things that are uh, feeling so negative in the world. And I think it's actually exacerbating or magnifying the anxieties that people have and the fears. Those things were always there under the surface. So walk us through that trauma as a nine year old boy and what happened that day. Um, I was homesick. We were living in Pico Rivera, California. And uh, six days after my ninth birthday, my dad walks up. He said something to me. I watched him walk out the back door. He opened up the garage. I watched him close the back door. He never came out. So after 10 minutes, my mom realized something and um, called my brother-in-law, who ran a liquor store around the corner. He came over, opened the garage, <clears throat> shut it again. Firemen and policemen come. They threw me in the back bedroom. Uh, I snuck out and saw my dad on a stretcher. <clears throat> so oh. I saw him on a stretcher, and then the next time I saw him was at the funeral. Uh, but mm -hmm. what happens is, is that little boy, um, because um, back in my day, I'm dating myself, you know, um, they didn't have any medical help or anything like they do today. They pushed everything under the rug. So right. I, just, I just internalized 
And I thought myself as the black sheep, the reason I did drugs and alcohol, because I didn't care. I just mm. wanted to turn my brain off from the pain. It didn't care how yeah. beautiful girlfriend I had, how great I did in stunt business or whatever. There was still the void until Jesus showed up on that January 12, 1992 and changed everything. But the, yeah. pain, the pain was causing me to kill myself through, through drugs and alcohol. I just wanted it to stop. Yeah. We we try to numb it because we don't know how to deal with it. And we don't, you know, I think the biggest lie of the enemy is to um, torment us when we're in that place of, of such pain that's overwhelming and, and it affects our identity. I mean, it, it, it wants to just take us into such a dark place that what the enemy is after is that image of God in, on us. He wants your identity. And, and so he uses these woundings to cause us to even make inner vows. I mean, did you make any inner vows that day or, or in that season of your life? Um, did it affect you in terms of trusting people or your relationship or, or your thoughts about your own self-worth? You know, <laughs> Well, one thing is I don't remember my past past nine years old. That was yeah. completely blocked. I, I, yeah. I can't tell you the thing I did with my dad. I I, I, I know nothing. Wow. And that was trauma right there. And it was either one thing, it was either trauma or God removing it. But I know Satan uses the lie that you're not worthy enough, you're not good enough. And although I was raised a Lutheran, um, I never thought I fit in. I never thought I belonged. Yeah. So I, I would always act as if, and act out. I tried to be the life of the party. Heck, when I did drugs, I always bought the drugs because I didn't want to be alone. You know, yeah. same same with when I uh, drank and, and stuff. And I only turned to cocaine because the alcohol was not working anymore. Yeah. It wasn't stopping the pain. And mm -hmm. you said something early on. It's not what's going on. It's what's really going on in your heart. Until yeah. you get to that deep area of your heart and you're willing to say, here it is, right. God, you're going to continue to make that loop. Mm -hmm. You've got to expose it because it's what we hide ends mm -hmm. up empowering the enemy to be used against us. Yeah. And he used me against my own self. <laughs> you know, it's right. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I believe Jesus, the, the whole point of salvation is to not just save us from the enemy, but from ourselves. I mean, <laughs> you know, we uh, come into this world in a broken system and we learn mindsets from our families, from our life experiences, and these things become the filters that all information flows through. And it's how we process, it's how we look at our relationships, it's how we learn to treat other people, um, you know, and even how we will disconnect from ourselves and how we treat ourselves. I struggled with loving myself. And now I've heard that many victims of uh, suicide of loved ones will suffer from this feeling of, well, I wasn't good enough for you to fight for yourself. You know, I, I wasn't enough, especially children. Did that, was that a plaguing thought for you? I, I, I think I didn't learn that to order, but I do know that suicide is the biggest lie in the world because mm -hmm. it is a permanent fix to a temporary problem. Yeah. And that's the thing. And, and I, you know, I, I really don't know. I don't, it's not that I don't remember, but I think I just kind of like mm -hmm. numbed it. And yeah. With whatever you know, and it's like when all, all I wanted to do was be a motocross, and that wasn't going to happen because my mom wasn't into that. And I and wow. you know, opened the door for Azusa Pacific College, where you know God had His hand on me even when I was trying to self destruct myself. You know, yeah, and, yeah. You know, I survived neurosurgery in, in 1980. I had seven mm -hmm. hours of neurosurgery in the back. I almost died from that. I mean, so many times God has had His hand on me. It's almost scary. It's like on another 48 hours. I was a millimeter for getting run over by a streetcar. God picked up the jacket on my and moved me out of the way, mm. or I would be dead. I mean, it's just. Yeah. But um, yeah. I don't know if we realize the trauma we're in when we're younger. I didn't. I just know that I acted out because something was off. And part of it is that thing you described as hiding. You know, we. We, uh, I, I'm thinking of right now as you were talking about how Adam and Eve, I mean, the first thing they did was hide. You know, they started co covering themselves. That is our human propensity to want to cover ourselves, to cover our shame, to cover our nakedness and our vulnerability. We don't like being vulnerable. Mm 
And it's actually the place that we birth something new. And Jesus calls us to that place. That is the fellowship and the suffering of the cross is to learn to be vulnerable, to accept some of our sufferings and to be able to ponder them and then invite the Holy Spirit into those really hard places that we don't like to visit, right? And say, God, this is where I need you right here. The, you know, the world thinks of Christians and Christianity as just a bunch of puffed up, uh, hypocritical, perfectionistic people. And, and perhaps that has affected um, part of our belief system. Maybe that's been a part of it um, because of legalism for uh, many generations. But, you know, that's been in itself coming unraveled for a long time. And people are getting honest and they're, they're starting to take the mask off. And so I really believe, John, that it's exactly as you said, God had a purpose for you. And that's what I want people to hear today. God had such a purpose. He has one for every single person, no matter what you're going through. And he reached in, listen, he, he describes himself as the good shepherd who will leave the 99 of the fold to run after the one who's gone astray. And in a sense, you doing those drugs and the alcohol and this kind of lifestyle that was self-destructive um, was in itself, really kind of a, a maybe even a, a death wish, you know, a, a just an I want out, you know. I think, tell us what it felt like to meet Jesus on that horizon where you just had no hope. Tell it, 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 I want you to share with our viewers from your perspective what it was like to really meet the person of Jesus at the lowest of the low. I, uh... In 1990, I had walked away from the film business. At first off, I never did drugs and alcohol, or that was never my deal. Mm, was yeah. Afterwards, like I said, but when uh, I walked away in 1990, I dated an actress, and she said, "You're the best boyfriend I've ever had," but I don't want a boyfriend. <laughs> and it was like a wow. life story, and it was the wow. big rejection and abandonment. And in yeah. my brain, I said, well, F this, I'm out of here. And I did mm -hmm. cocaine for 18 months. I went through about $130,000. I just wanted to die. And I didn't know I wanted to die, but I just walked away. My family did tough love. They wouldn't deal with me anymore. To make a long story short, uh, I screamed at God. I yelled at God. I need your help. I want your help. I've been to rehabs. But on January 12, 1992, I was in a hotel room in Almonte, California trying to find my drug dealer one more time. Couldn't find any of them, imagine that. And uh, I heard a voice. I heard an audible voice in my ears, just like you and I were talking. And the voice said, you will not pick up the phone again after mm. drugs and alcohol after 11 o'clock tonight. Wow. I went, wow, you have, I thought to myself, you have a sense of humor. Instantly, the voice started again, same voice. The voice said, but you will go back to Alcoholics Anonymous for me. The voice stopped. Being the good drug addict I was from 1030 to 11, I dialed and tried to find my dealers. I found them. I put the phone down. About nine in the morning, I called my mom and I said, can I come home? Something happened. Mm. For 30 years, I haven't had a drink or drug since. But wow. I did what God told me to do. He wanted me to go learn. Hey, hey, alcohol, the 12 steps have a great thing. They have a four step, which you were talking about. You get all the garbage out. And mm -hmm. I think God wanted me to get that garbage out before I would walk back with him the way he started to change my life in, in 1994. And um, but that God that showed up in that hotel room changed my life. And I heard his mm -hmm. voice again just before I doubled Harrison Ford. I was driving home from Burbank Studio. My Explorer went deaf silent at five o'clock on Southern California traffic. And the voice said, Mary will come back. That was a girlfriend. But your career will come back tenfold in my timing. Two days later, I got a phone call. How would you like to double Harrison Ford? So wow. Being out of the business almost two and a half years, I, um, a year getting sober because I, I got sober a year before I decided to go back for work. I couldn't find work just because I wasn't established. God took me from not getting work to doubling the number one box office star in the world for five years. 
Amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. You know, <laughs> when you when you talked about that audible voice telling you, you will not make that call and you will get up and you will go do this for me. Talk, referring to the 12 step program. Uh, you know what that is? That's a modern day uh, picture of when Jesus met the man at uh, the pools of Bethesda. And he said, do you want to be well? And he said, take up your bed. In other words, get up right. and walk. Right. And there's something to be said here. There's something to be recognized and understood about when Jesus tells us, when the Spirit of the Lord comes in and, and, and convicts us. And not, that's not a negative thing. That's an alarming, awakening thing. When Jesus himself speaks to us and says, get up take up this bed and I want you to walk because I'm going to be with you. And that is how we get our healing. I mean, your healing has been progressive. That's how my healing has been. Mm -hmm. And I, I want, I so appreciate you telling your story. It's what I want uh, for people to see is that God's glory shines through our weaknesses because he is the one who completes us. It isn't in our perfections. And listen, we're not here saying that everyone has a license to sin. This is not about sloppy grace. This is not about not caring about our walk with Jesus because it is the kindness of the Lord that draws us to, to make the change and, the, and to have a repentant heart. That's what the scriptures tell us. So, John, I know that you are anointed to share, uh, you speak and you share your testimony. Um, what are some of the things that God's uh, opened doors for you to be able to make a difference in other people's lives? Are you, are you able to share any treatment centers or anything like that? You know, ever since the divorce, um, I kind of dedicated myself to be a parent. But in 2011 and 2014, I went to Ireland for 10 days each with my good buddy, Tommy O'Donnell as my armor bearer, and he used to play professional baseball and lives in San Clemente. But, um, and I, I would speak off and on at churches and stuff, but the, the truth was I, I pulled back because of my full-time ministry had become my children. Uh, yeah. Since I've been in Georgia, I've spoken for Dan Cathy, who owns Chick-fil-A. Oh, a, nice. At a thing called the construction meeting at Trillith, and I've spoken at Southside Church, which is uh, one of the, uh, Stanley's son's church, Andy, but you know, my ministry is every day because we travel so much around the country with my daughter and son racing. I minister every time I see someone. I'm not afraid to stop someone like yeah. Travis Worth, he's from Northern California. A couple months ago, I knew he was hurting and grabbing, prayed for him. About a month ago, I saw this fireman friend that runs a team. I just knew something was wrong. His best friend was just killed the night before in a fire you get to give back and and i am yeah. far from perfect i God, god's mercy carries me in grace every single yeah. day of my life because i will not say my hands up i'm i'm joe christian not as close as all but our god's mm -hmm. grace and mercy i believe carry us so i just continue to be the light my daughter says why do you talk to everybody <laughs> <laughs> that's the jesus yeah. in us yeah see the G the same Jesus mm. that had me give Harrison Ford and Burt Reynolds a Bible, and wow. after I gave him a Bible, I ended. They stopped hiring me. Well, I don't know if it was because of that or not, or Satan. But it's like when I gave Harrison his Bible. What am I going to give someone that has everything? Right. I, That's I good. I give him a Bible, and I did. But yeah, our ministry is twenty four seven. It's it's every yeah. day we walk, and so yes. day, you know, it moment. is. And, and I think that's the greatest thing. It's ongoing. It's not in the church. It's not in an event. It's every day. How do you treat people? Amen. And I, I love that that's who you are. And, uh, you know, when we have tasted the goodness of God. We want to tell people about it. You know, come and taste and see that the Lord is good. And that's what you're all about. I appreciate you so much, my friend. Well, and I thank you for being here with me today. To give back. Girl, it's yes. all about giving back. Amen. How can people find you? Do you have a website? Well, you know, the websites are down right now. Um, okay. I'm going to say this. 
if you want if you want to have John come and speak for you, uh, you can contact me at brendacrouch.com, info at Brenda Crouch. And uh, if we as we continue to get more information uh, for what you're doing and keeping up with you, we can promote that. But listen, I appreciate you. I have my email, John Alden Stunts at AOL or J Alden Ministries at AOL. Okay. That's how they can reach me. And, Good. Uh, and so, and I have a PO box in Peachtree City. But you know, like I said, I have dedicated myself to being a parent, yeah. and uh, which means I'm yeah. not stuck in my ministry. But thank That's you, right. Ms. Linda, for having the kindness to have bringing me in to open up some people's eyes, get their hearts, and get them out of themselves, and let God do the work. Yes, thank you. And we're going to do this again sometime, okay? I hope to see you soon. Yes, we will. we got to get Willie on there, remember? Yeah, we're going to do that. Okay. Much, much and love, listen. You guys. Yes, Bye. you too. Friends, thank you for joining with us today. It has been just my honor and my privilege to be able to share a real story of how Jesus meets us in the deepest pit, in the deepest, darkest place of our shame and our hopelessness. And he comes there to love us, to hold us, and to show us that there is a way to make all things new again. I appreciate you taking the time to be with us today, and I, enjoy, I, I invite you again to join us next time. I'm Brenda Crouch.